streets and ask any average Indian man or woman this question. If you had one cell phone and you have a son and daughter, both of which currently without a cell phone, who would you give it to? Who would you choose among your son and your daughter? Good morning, everyone. My name is Mihika Shri Krishna. I'm a student of grade 11, and today I'm going to be exploring the second sub-theme, challenging the patriarchal society. So what do you think is the answer? This choice has been made by fathers, mothers, and the years of conditioning that makes society feel a certain way. And the same choice is being made every time it has to be made. Seven out of 10 Indian women do not have a cell phone. Yes, you heard me right. Only 31% of women in India have a cell phone. A massive 70% don't even have a feature phone. Forget a smartphone. In today's world, when most of us can't live without our cell phones for even a few hours, when many poor earn their livings because of their cell phones, the statistic I gave implies that these women have been condemned to their current state with very little opportunity to increase that state. And through this one decision, mothers, fathers, society has made a choice that the boy shall have more opportunities that the boy shall get priority over the girl. Today, only 19% of women in India participate in the workforce. And this number is only decreasing since it was 28% in 2019. Not owning a cell phone could be a big reason for this. The women's workforce participation in Saudi Arabia is 33% versus 19% in the world's largest democracy that worships several million female deities. Yes, we build temples for our Durgas and our Lakshmis and our Saraswatis, but we don't give cell phones to our daughters. We send our sons to school, to college, to postgraduate education, and we take pride in being the fifth largest economy in the world. But we aren't bothered by the fact that majority of our women do not have a cell phone and thus do not have access to basic information and thus are not able to augment their knowledge and thus do not have ease of life. Have we ever wondered how quickly we can become a five or a $10 trillion economy if we give a cell phone to each woman and they say, teach a man and you teach that man. But teach a woman and she teaches the whole house. Similarly, give a cell phone to a man. Well, not sure what men will do then, but give a cell phone to a woman and she will improve the state of the entire family. The good news is that over time, patriarchy has definitely been getting the treatment that it deserves. Very openly, it has become unacceptable. However, is becoming unacceptable enough? Does it exist behind closed doors? Does it exist beyond what our eyes can see? Society does form stereotypes. But what about the stereotypes that women have embraced themselves through internalization? That it is inherently a woman's responsibility to cook food, manage groceries, and clean the house. And equally so for men, that it is a man's responsibility to drive the car, earn for the household, and manage the finances. And what does this lead to? Living up to the expectations of a patriarchal society reinforces these roles so much so that they start bringing joy. My 54-year-old family friend tells me about his 80-year-old mother who still insists on cooking food for him every time he goes back home. Now, think about it. She has been making him food every day till he left his house at the age of 20. 
Of course, cooking for her oldest son gives this mother a sense of joy and delight. But it started out as a manifestation of patriarchy, that it's the woman's responsibility to cook food for her children. Patriarchy enforces strong stereotypes on men and women. Men are considered strong and macho, while women are considered vulnerable and weak. Imagine, these stereotypes are so strong that even people in same-sex relationships feel a need to conform to these. I'm sure we have all heard of, whether it's in real life or through the media, people in same-sex relationships referring to their roles similar to that of a heterosexual relationship, of being a husband and a wife. Now, of course, this is not true for all couples, but many feel a need to conform to these norms. Just a couple of months back, I interviewed a second-year student from IIT Delhi pursuing chemical engineering. She told me that in her class of 100 students, 80 are boys. This is today, as we speak. My father tells me that when he studied engineering in the early 1990s, boys made up 90% of the class. So just a 10% increase in the ratio of girls to boys studying engineering over three decades, over 30 years, coming back to where we started from. Should we build more temples for our female deities or should we also give cell phones to our daughters? Should we be proud of the six or seven odd percent of growth of our economy or should we stubbornly push for a double-digit growth by having more of our girls pursue higher education, way beyond school, all the way up to college and postgraduate? We all have to make a choice to change the world outside of our cocooned lives. The world is not made for us in here, in this auditorium. The world out there is very different for everyone and more so for our women. I recently repeated a global and very well-known experiment where I asked people across genders, across age groups, to name five scientists. Not one, I repeat, not one named a single woman scientist. Science has proven that women are not less capable than men in any field, including STEM. Is it that men are better at math and science? Well, that doesn't explain Mary Curie's double Nobel Prize, her daughter's Nobel Prize, or our own Shakuntala Devi's mathematical prowess. And I'm sure we've all heard of the ISRO women who played a pivotal role in sending our recent rockets to space through the Chandrayaan and the Mangalyaan mission. Even at our own school, HIXS, the science and math department are predominantly women. <laughs> During a conversation with Dr. Jayashri Venkateshan, who works in ecological restoration, biodiversity protection, and wetland restoration, she explained to me how her male peers would doubt her ability to complete her PhD in science, even more so to pursue a PhD in science. Despite all of our progress in arguably every field, we seem to have forgotten about patriarchy. How do we explain our failure to eliminate patriarchy despite all our education? Is it that we are refusing to unlearn? Or are we just not serious enough to solve patriarchy? My father packs lunch for me, my brother, and my mother every single day. So is it that he solved the problem of patriarchy in our household? Well, possibly, but is the world ready to listen? I've often wondered if even he feels the pressure that patriarchy puts on him. Mard ko dard nahi hota. Sounds like a Bollywood film, right? Yes, it is. Men feel pain just as much as women do. But then, did most women not grow up their boys with boys don't cry and don't cry like a girl? 
men have been forced to bottle up their emotions. Someday, such bottled emotions have to come out. And when they do, there's more damage done to people around them. Without realizing it, patriarchy impacts men too. Women are allowed to express their emotions. We are allowed to cry it out. Men aren't. Women complain that patriarchy is inherently a man's doing. But we shouldn't complain if this is what we are teaching our own sons. Mothers and fathers need to start the depatriarching process as soon as possible. As soon as their children can walk and talk. By giving equal chores to both, children's, both children. And by giving boys specific responsibilities. Like making the bed, setting the table, cooking, clearing, buying groceries. Everything that makes a home, a home. And also by giving them a safe space and allowing them to express their emotions. We go back to the start. Equal responsibilities for both genders. Toy cars for both genders. And most importantly, a cell phone for both genders. Thank you.